play something? Yeah. When you want to hear them, unmute this, mute this. Yes. When you want to be heard, yeah. mute that, unmute this. Unmute this. this. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. Okay. So calm down, everyone. So we're going to get started with the seminar. Uh, today we have, uh, so Ian, I'm going to go and, uh, ahead and introduce you, and then uh, it will be back to you with the presentation. So thanks, everyone, for uh, joining uh, in E6 seminar today. Today we have uh, Dr. Ian Dobson with us, who will be talking to us about how long is a resilient resiliency event in a transmission system, metrics and model driven by utility data. Uh, Dr. Ian Dobson received his uh, bash Bachelor of Arts, BA in Mathematics from Cambridge University, and his PhD in Electrical Engineering from Cornell. He previously worked as an operations analyst in Britain and as a professor for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's currently Sandburg Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Iowa State University. Ian's main interest is applying risk analysis, complex system simulation, and nonlinear dynamics to avoid electric power systems blackouts. Ian is a fellow of the IEEE. Thanks so much, Ian, for joining us with uh, for, for giving the seminar today, and we look forward to your presentation. Back to you. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, thanks so much, Anamika. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you all today and, um, uh, and get a chance to um, present and discuss on resilience, which uh, is a, you know, an, an emerging topic of great interest. Um, and so this is joint work with Svetlana Ekashiva of NERC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to talk about transmission systems today. Of course, uh, the distribution systems is also important, but today I'm going to talk about events in transmission systems and ask uh, a question that you may think is kind of trivial uh, about how long is a resilience event? Because in a resilience event, you get some, some outages and then you get some restores and um, of components of the system. And surely the uh, how long it lasts is you take the first outage time and you take the last restore time, you subtract them, and that's the event duration, right? So why am I giving a talk about this? It's, it's easy, right? Well, um, I, I think what I'd like to do is um, persuade you that uh, there's a lot more to it. And in fact, to um, address part of this, um, we need different metrics and uh, new models of that are driven by the utility data that's collected by NERC. So um, I hope to persuade you that this isn't a silly question. So um, first of all, uh, we, we have a lot of data and we process it into events and then into outage and restore processes and performance curves, and then we get the metrics. Now this is all pretty straightforward, but it's, it's, it's somewhat new. Um, and so I wanted to go over that first because that's the foundation for, for, for what we are doing here. So everything's data driven. Um, and um, there's the TAD system, which records outages and restores to the nearest minute um, all across North America. Um, TADS stands for Transmission Availability Data System. And um, NERC has all the data from all the North American utilities. And um, it's also gathered um, uh, worldwide by other utilities. So we have six years of uh, the forced outages across North America, and that's something like 62,000 outages. And um, uh, so what we do is pro process that into events, and we want to look at this, the not, not the small events, but the ones with at least 10 outages. Now, more than 300 of these are the majority, a vast majority are weather related. There are some other causes. So we process these um, these these data into events um, that are the larger events with more than ten outages. So what is an event? Uh, and you know we're not doing this by hand. We need an algorithm to extract the events. So um, uh, uh, can you see my cursor? Okay. Um, so here's here's the time axis along here, and here's a bunch of outages happening, and so this left end is the outage happening and the right end is, is restoring. You can see that um, uh, what's happening is the outages are, are bunching up uh, because of bad weather or something, and they're overlapping. And we use a criterion that looks at how they bunch up and overlap to extract these events. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the detail of that. 
It's a bit tricky um, uh, getting the algorithm, but we think we have a meaningful algorithm that produces events that look like uh, what you would extract by hand if, 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 if you looked at the, the events. And you know this is real data, so it comes in different forms. Here's three examples of the 300 or more. Um, but you can see that they all have bunching up and overlapping. So we automatically detect these events. So now we've got an event. Um, this is an event that happened over several days. Um, we have a performance curve. This is a standard thing in resilience analysis. Your performance goes down as the outages happen and your um, uh, performance goes up as the restores happen. So um, what's happening here is in initially when it goes down, when there's an outage and it goes up when there's a restore. And in the, in the beginning, the outages win and you, you are mostly going down. And then later on, the restores win um, and then you get some final restores getting back to um, to zero out. So this is just simply the cumulative unrestored outages over time. And then or the negative of that because people like to have it go below the axis um, to show um, uh, to track what's going on in the um, in, in, in the event. So this is your performance curve. Now this is good and useful. But um, what, what I like to do is decompose this performance curve into an outage process and a restore process. The outage process is very easy. It's just the cumulative number of outages. So in this case, we have 13 outages um, and they happen in the, in, the, in the first portion of the event. You can see the, count, the outage process counting them up, up to 13 uh, and then, then, then all the outages are done. And there's a little delay before the restore process happens, starts. So the first restore occurs here. And that uh, the restore process is a cumulative restores. So it just counts up the restores, 0, 1, 2, up to 13, and then, and then you're done. And um, uh, actually, the performance curve, um, because it goes down when there's an outage and up when there's a restore, is the restore process minus the outage process. So if you know the outage process and the restore process, you get back your standard performance curve. And it's very, very easy to, given the performance curve, to decompose it into the outage process and restore process. So this is equivalent information, you haven't lost any information. But the important thing here is the outage process and the restore process it can overlap in time. Because if you, um, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in, in, in a minute. But the but the thing is about the outage process and the restore process performance curve, the dimensions and shapes of all these processes give you your metrics. You can get any, any, any lots of standard metrics from these. The ones we're interested in today are the, are the duration metrics. So um, you can see that the, um, the outages are, are occur approximately linearly. Um, so that you can draw a line through them and get an outage rate. You can get a duration of outages which is from the first outage to the last outage, from here to here. You got the delay before the first restore, the time to the first restore, and then you've got the restore duration, which is the first restore to the last restore. And then the event duration is all the way from the first uh, outage to the last restore. So um, immediately from all the, once you've figured out this for all the 300 or so events, you can extract all the metrics you like. And these are just standard, kind of metrics. One thing to notice though, you, you don't, it's not a good idea to have a linear approximation to the restore rate because you restore fast initially and then it slows down a lot and then even a whole lot. I mean, the, the, the time between the last two restorers in this case was um, uh, at least a day and a half. Um, and uh, so it slows down a lot um, uh, in, the, in the last few restores. Um, okay, so to give you some idea of numbers, um, here's some median numbers. Um, the, uh, the number of outages is 26. The outage duration is five hours. On the other hand, the restore process and the event duration, they're about five days, and the time to first restore is about half an hour. And the thing about the restore duration and the event duration is they're highly variable because they depend on these last few restores. And um, that creates a, a problem. So um, uh, here again, here's some more examples. 
Um, we've got 300 of these, so I thought I'd so show a couple of them. Uh, you can see the roughly linear or vaguely linear um, outage process, and you can see a restore process that slows down at the end, and the consequences for the performance curve is also showing. Um, so um, one thing that about this is it doesn't look like the idealized performance trapezoid in the literature. Um, there the idea, and it's a useful idealization in many cases, but um, uh, there the idea is you have an outage phase and then a phase where there's a delay and then there's a phase of, re of restoration. Um, so only outages, only delay and only restore um, marked off by, by time fa phases in time. I don't think that's the right way to do it um, uh, for uh, uh, realistically because um, because the outage and, pro and restore processes overlap, as you can see in these all these examples, um, uh, and it's even more the case in distribution systems. The, there's even more overlap. So uh, I think the this idea of the of taking this performance curve it works for the trapezoid to decompose it in outage and restore, but it also works for real data. I think it's the right way to go. So um, don't use phases for real things, use um, processes. And here's just some more examples of the outage and restore processes and some approximations to them. The red line is the one we're gonna be using. And um, just to show that there's a whole variety of, um, uh, of, 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 of these, um, uh, we can't hope to model every, every detail of all of them, but we're we're going to try and get a model that's good good for at least a majority of them. So um, so what 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 do you have so far? We extract events. Um, we can get durations from all these processes, um, and the our event duration is the time to the first restore plus the restore duration. Um, uh, that is the time from the first outage to the first restore, plus the uh, first restore to the last restore. N is the number of outages throughout. And so the time to first restore, which turned out to have a median of half an hour, is straightforward. The trouble is with the restore duration, which is the last restore minus the first restore. And really what I'm going to be concentrating on is the last restores have high statistical variability. Now, if you have something that's very inherently statistically variable and you're trying to use it as a metric, there's a problem because if you take a sample of it, I mean, that is you have an, one particular event you're interested in, you take a sample of it, you know that if the event turned out a little differently, it will be quite a different value. And we want to be able to um, get a handle on this variability and um, uh, see how metrics perform and get good metrics um, that with less variability. But the other reason is an engineering reason is that you may not care about the last restores too much because um, uh, you've got redundancy in the transmission system and uh, you know it might be in a remote area or something and, um, and there's redundancy, you can feed it some, some other way. And um, it's not really that relevant to the performance um, from, a, from a utility um, uh, doing their job kind of point of view, whether, whether that last, when that last restore is done because of the redundancy in the transmission system. So you may not care that much because it may not have much impact. Okay, so we have this intuitive idea that the last restores can take days and they distort this, this duration metric and it's highly variable depends exactly when you can do it and all, all the things, all the complicated things people do to fix um, power systems. Um, but uh, to quantify this, we need a stochastic model of the restore process. Now, making models of all this stuff is, I think, generally useful and exciting. But for this work, we this is why we, we were motivated in this work. We just wanted to know um, what, um, how variable the the, uh, the metrics like this restore duration um, dn how how variable it is. So um, to get the stochastic models, there's two ingredients: there's a log normal distribution and a Poisson process, and then I'll talk about the models. So I just wanted to remind you of these things. Um, 
So a log normal distribution, you start with a normal distribution with uh, mean, mu, and, and standard deviation sigma. So here's the mean, and uh, you can see the standard deviation. And you take the exponential of that random variable, standard random variable, and you get a, a, a probability distribution that looks like this. And you can see that because the um, exponential stretches things, especially for large l n n numbers, um, uh, it, it stretches it out into a heavy tail here. And so that means that you can expect um, extreme values and you can expect them to be extremely variable when you sample. And um, but uh, but most of the most of the probability is is in this initial portion. And one thing to note is that the if you take the 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 median of the um, normal distribution, yeah, that's the point where you got 50% of the probability less than this value, 50% of the probability bigger than this value. Um, exponential preserves order. So the, the median is here for the log normal distribution, um, but it but there's quite a bit of probability out in this heavy tail, and it's quite different than a normal distribution. In any case, if you have two parameters, and it's important to remember that these are the parameters of the corresponding normal distribution, not the parameters of the log, not directly the parameters of the log normal. So, um, and of course, there's a formula for it. So all I want to show here is that if you know your mu and your sigma, you have a formula. And um, this median that I'm talking about is e to the power mu. And it's also the geometric mean of the log normal distribution. And uh, the way you get the just geometric mean, if you have n samples, you just multiply them all together. And then you take the one over nth root of that. That's your geometric mean. And that's the good mean for the log normal. So that's just a reminder about the log normal. The other ingredient we need is Poisson process. So um, if we have a Poisson process of a certain rate, um, that means that and lambda depending on time, that means that the probability of a point occurring in a small interval is the rate times the length of that small interval, the rate at that time times the small interval. So um, point occurring, we're going to be using this for outages and restores. So it's the probability of an outage occurring or the probability of a restore occurring in, in a small interval. Other than that, in different intervals, um, it, it's an independent wh wh whether it actually happens or not. Um, so that's your Poisson process. Um, and um, we got two sorts of Poisson processes. One is for an, with a uniform rate. Um, and if you have a given number of points of a Poisson sample from a Poisson process, suppose we know we have 50 outages, so we have 50 points. Then, um, and we know they came from a Poisson process, then we know that those points are 50 samples from a uniform distribution on the interval. So here's our interval, here to here, and the grayscale shows a constant uh, rate, a constant probability density. And then you take 50 samples, and they occur somewhat randomly. There's a little bit of clumping and so on, but it, but it, but it, but it's uniform along the uniform rate along the. And if you take another sample, of course, you get a different pattern of dots, but they don't um, clump up preferentially in any one part of the interval. And um, if we have a Poisson process with log normal rate, um, it's different. Um, the, the density of the rate is high where you've got the probability density here. Um, and so when you take a sample, you can see that the points tend to cluster um, where the rate is high. So this is high restore rate, and this is low restore rate as, as, as it gets slower and slower. So this is this is what you need to know about Poisson processes for the model. There's all sorts of other things. It's a very popular, um, uh, uh, very popular process. But this is what we need to get going with the models. So the outage process, um, I commented that it, it was going up roughly linearly in in the examples I showed you. So you you assume a a a constant rate. Um, so the the rate is um, roughly speaking the number of points divided by the length of the interval. And that gives you the slope of this line that approximates the stochastic process. Remember the outage process just simply counts the 
uh, outages as they occur. There's eight outages here, and uh, uh, goes up one every time there's a, there's there's one of these outages, and um, the average of these will be this linear increase here, um, which is um, the rate times the time. Um, so that's our model of the outage process, and our model of the res uh, the restore process. It has different rate characteristics because it goes up fast in the beginning and then slow um, in uh, as you go along. So we have a log normal distribution of these eight points. Um, and um, so we can also get a formula for uh, for the rate. It's going to be um, uh, the number of points roughly times the log normal PDF. Um, so um, uh, that when you integrate it up, you're going to get a change of eight. Um, that's why this this here, and um, the average value is just integrating up the um, log normal PDF, and you're going to get something like the cumulative distribution function, which is this dotted dotted line. And so, um, if you if you look at the formulas, you can see that um, uh, you you can see that um, this is this this is phi this phi here is um oops this fee here is um the um the cumulative distribution function of the standard um normal distribution and the the point is that we have a formula i mean it's it's complex it's a little complicated but we have a formula for this line that are that is the average restore process it's proportional to a log normal dis distribution um, uh, uh, CDF. So, OK, I've just sort of suggested these models. They're qualitatively right, but let's look at their actual fit to the data. So all, all the events have their own mu and sigma, but if you um, take the log of the um, restore times and um, uh, subtract off the mean mu and divide by the sigma that is estimated from the data, you should get a normal distribution of mean zero and uh, standard deviation one. So we plot plot these the CDF of them over each other, and you can see that the, it's not perfect. There's some deviation, but it's um, it's it's roughly right. And also, if you do a quantile quantile plot, a QQ plot, so called. Um, if it's perfect, um, it lies along this uh, this line here, and you can see that um, if you take all the 300 events and do this to it, you get points that lie approximately along uh, along this line. So that qualitative that looks qualitatively good. And if you do strict statistical tests um, at p equals 0.05, about 60% of the events satisfy. Um, strict statistical tests, which isn't exactly what you want to know, but it, it is evidence that um, uh, you're only rejecting it um, in a minority of cases. So we, we're not claiming that this is a model for every event, but we it's the typical case and it's a typical model and it's um, prevalent enough to be useful um, is, is our claim. So we're going to use this log normal restore model. Uh, if you try other models like an exponential um, restore process, you can see that it's not it it, it really starts deviating a lot. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that. It's not a good choice. And the uniform outage rate model also is, looks looks pretty good it's, it, it, as being typical. It's not perfect, but it's um it's pretty good considering this is real data. So now we have now we have um uh, uh, you know. Uh, our our outage and restore processes and um, our performance curve. So we got all we so we were particularly interested in the restore curve and the restore duration. Um, so we can think about metrics and we have a model for the restore. So we can look at its statistical variability and try and quantify this general unease we have that um, the um, that if we just measure straightforwardly measure the length of the restore uh, time. Uh, you know, the last restore minus the first restore, that's going to be too variable to be useful. You see, there's a, there's a fundamental thing that if you have um, the conventional distributions that are not heavy tailed, 
it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, you know, the, the mean is a sensible re representative. Um, you know, you know, you don't get um, extreme values and all that. But if we're work, but the log normal is a um, is is a distribution with a heavy tail. So we have to be careful. The mean doesn't isn't really representative. Um, it's 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 highly variable. We're going to get extreme events, and and um, and those extreme those extremes in the samples are going to cause high variability. So let's put it all together and um, uh, see um, what what we can do. So um, our restore times. The first restore is at time r one. The second one is at time r two. Then r three. R4 and up to the nth one at Rn. So we can we're looking here at the restore times relative to the first one. So um, it's this n minus one of these. There. Um, uh, so this is these are the the um, the duration of the restore measured of each restore measured relative to the first one being at zero. Uh, so. Um, the first thought, of course, is to take the last one minus the first one, and this is the restore duration uh, dn. Uh, that's the one we're going to show is highly variable, and there was also an engineering reason maybe we don't even care about the very last restore. You could you could back off a bit and look at the n minus one restore, but that's going to be very different for uh, a, a restore process of 100 outages. It's going to be the 99th one, um, the, the time to the 99th one. Uh, whereas if you, you've got 10, it's the one to the ninth one. So it doesn't really make that much sense to look at the n minus one restore. Now this is what what we um, uh, what's what we use at the moment. Um, uh, I don't think it's the best one, but um, if you want some idea of the extent, um, you could say okay. When we when we when we've got more than 95% restored um, in the transmission system, 95% uh, of the outages, the, we, the first right restore time with more than that restored is substantially restored, and that's the duration we can use. Now, but there's a problem with that one as well because it it also changes with the number of outages. It seems quite sensible if you've got 200 outages, but if you've got 19 outages. It's always going to be the last one, and if you've got 21 outages, it's going to be the 19th one, and so it's sort of lumpy and it doesn't change smoothly. Now there's a way around that that you can look up um, all the different sorts of quantiles there are that that essentially interpolate to the 90% level or the 95% level from data. There's a paper by Hinman and Fan with um, at least a dozen different types of quantiles um, that interpolate in various different ways. So um, without going into the rabbit hole, we chose one of them and um, we use that for 95%. For and we think that if you're going to measure the extent up to, to substantially restore, that this is probably the best performing one for the reasons I've said. It's not lumpy. It's, it isn't the last one. It, it, it's got a consistent definition across various sizes of events. Um, it's a little bit complicated to uh, compute. But um, you know, if you're working in statistical software like R, it's a standard function. Um, so then there's other things that you can think about. Um, you could take um, a, a, you know, logs of all these uh, time differences, and then you could look at their mean. That's this parameter mu of, of, of the log normal distribution. Um, or you could take the standard deviation of those log restore times. That's the standard deviation. That tells you something. Um, and if you could take these values and put it in the log normal model and look at when when the log normal model had 95% restore. And that varies smoothly, but um, perhaps that's not a bad idea. The log normal model is probably the best one if you're going to pick one, but it doesn't cover all the cases. Um, uh, so um, maybe it's a bad idea to assume the model. And a, and a bad way of doing it, at least for our data, is that you take the arithmetic mean of all these restores, and that turns out to be the time constant if you fit an exponential, which I'm not re recommending, and then you can take the restore time to 95% of the exponential. This seems to be sensible, 
But the trouble is that the exponential is is um, not a typically good model. Its fit is much worse typically than the log normal. So that's out. You can look at the median restore time. That's the time to uh, restore halfway. But uh, the star, in terms of variability at least, turns out to be the geometric mean of the restore times. So you take all these restore times differences, you multiply them together, you take the one over n through one over n minus one root of that, and that's your geometric mean. So that this turns out to be the star. But I'm just um, talking about the various considerations with all these um, uh, different metrics. And another great thing about the geometric mean, um, it's very natural for log normal types of things, but it's also an estimate of the median restore time for the reason that I I, I pointed out on the um, on 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 the uh, graph showing the the normal distribution and the log normal distribution. So the, there's a lot more choices. Once you start thinking about it, there's a lot more choices um, than you might think. So um, so how variable are they? That was the question that motivating all this work, trying to figure out. Um, what all the possibilities for, for metrics for the restore duration are and um, how good they are and what their interpretations are and so on and so forth. So, um, so what we're doing here is looking at um, events of different sizes, 10, 20 outages, 50 outages, 100 outages, 200 outages. And for each of those, we can compute the, the mu and sigma for each of those, um, uh, uh, each of those classes of events. And as you might expect, the uh, the mu increases with the size um, because e to the mu is the is the median um, uh, or a geometric mean. You expect it to go up with the with the number of outages, and also the standard deviation goes down a little bit. But this is a pretty sensitive parameter. So, so how do we measure the size of these confidence intervals? Instead of plus or minus an amount, we're choosing to um, measure it divided by something, multiplied by something, sort of divide times instead of plus minus. Um, so for example, if the this constant C is two, then the, the confidence interval uh, covers a, uh, a factor of two. You could be either be a factor of half too small or, uh, or double, um, or, and um, if, if C is three, you could be a third of the value or three times the value. And these are 90% confidence intervals. So if you computed the confidence intervals many times, they would cover the uh, true value with probability 0.9. So, um, so let's look at our culprit here. The, the, the obvious one that I, and the whole reason for the talk, that this one doesn't work. If you look at its variability under the log normal model, which is, at, uh, as we've shown, at least typical, um, I, I, you're off by a fact more than a factor of five for 10 outages, more about a factor of four for two, 20 outages, and you you can never do better than a factor of two. So this is pretty bad. Um, and this quantifies our uneasy feeling about the um, working with these heavy tail distributions. And um, you'll do a bit better if you look at the D95%, these are still highly variable, especially when n is small, but you're doing a bit better. And um, uh, so um, that's the variability you're putting up with in order to be able to measure the, subst the time to substantial completion. Um, so if that's what you're interested in, then, then this one's a good one. Um, on the other hand, if you look, look thinking more about utility performance, um, uh, I mean, you don't want to be measuring utility with performance with something that's highly variable, highly statistically variable, because um, if you haven't have any given event and you measure it, um, it, 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 it's off by far too big a factor. Um, you, you, you don't have any confidence in that value. Um, so, so all of these are, are pretty bad, uh, especially for the small uh, number of outages. But um, the, the, the geometric mean is by far the best of, of all of them. And um, it, if you have more than 17 outages, uh, you can do it within a factor of two at least. 
So, um, so uh, there's two purposes we're thinking about. One is to measure the time to substantially restore this D95% with the interpolating quantiles is better than, than, than some of the alternatives. Um, uh, but it's still highly variable once you get down into smaller events. Um, and if you want a, a very reliable way to assess performance, this geometric mean is, is less variable. And it also estimates the median, the halfway point that you've reached. Um, and, it, and it's better than the median. It's the directly computing the median. You can see it has better performance. So this is the kind of thing you can do with trying to quantify the difficulties of dealing with these heavy tail distributions, uh, which translate into um, samples of extreme samples of, um, of the last few restores, which take um, days, whereas the whole thing might have been over in, in, in 18 hours, or substantially. So, um, so this is what we've managed to do, um, uh, thinking about these models. And with this specific question is what's a good metric for the duration of a transmission event? So I thought what I'd do is um, just try and step back a bit and um, and say, okay, um, I mean, resilience is rapidly evolving at, as, as we speak. There's lots of people working on this with lots of good ideas. Um, but I wanted to give the view that this sort of an analysis tends towards and contrast it with with traditional reliability, which is, of course, um, very useful, but it's, it's it's doing different things, I think. So uh, the, for this view of, uh, for, or at least my view of, um, or a view of resilience, we, I, I think we're focusing on events where um, there's um, outages bunch up and overlap and we're interested in those um, events only. We don't mind what happens in between. Um, the outages occur and they're restored all the time, but it's um, that's a background process. We're interested in when weather comes in and stresses the power system, or there's a cascading outage or something like that, or both occurring. And um, during those events, um, we're looking at transient processes. Now, this is very important because of the type of math you use. Even if it's a Markov chain, for example, transient Markov chains analysis is very different than um, a steady state Markov chain analysis. On the other hand, traditional reliability um, is looking at steady state averaged over the year. And so you use um, steady state Markov analysis and you are interested in the performance smeared over the year, uh, not during just specific events. So it's very useful, but it's a, it tells you something different and the methods are quite different. For resilience, um, at least for this part here, um, I'm looking at system processes and performance. I'm not tracking individual components. When I look at that restore um, uh, function going up, I don't care which component are restored when, I'm only counting restores or, or tracking the number of restores. So it's like a systems point of view. I don't mind when um, which restore it is. Whereas in traditional liability, you're much more thinking about uh, modeling individual components. Of course, you're doing systems level analysis, but um, uh, you do care which one goes out. Um, and um, another difference is that um, we're, we must embrace heavy tails and extreme events. And um, this I idea of trying to look at the duration of, of restore duration uh, automatically looks at extreme events of the which are the last restores. They occur much, much uh, longer time uh, delay than most of the restores. Whereas traditional reliability, especially at the distribution level, they um, explicitly exclude extreme events because they knew very well that um, that uh, if you include extreme events, it messes up the statistics. Uh, so um, it, it wasn't out of ignorance; it was out of knowledge that you have to exclude them if you want sensible metrics that aren't too variable. So um, on one hand, we have heavy tails. On the other hand, I mean, some of the models uh, are quite rightly exponential because you can get away with it for some steady state problems, but they're light tailed. Um, so um, uh, 
there's some references um, uh, uh, very briefly. Um, this all is uh, in our archive preprint, and there's a few papers um, uh, about the basic processing that I mentioned, you know, of, uh, data to events to processes to uh, metrics um, in our PMATS paper. And these are also used in the state of reliability reports for the last two years. So th that's all available. This is all transmission work. Uh, for tra We've also uh, been learning about distribution systems. We have one paper in, in the transactions. But I'd also like to mention um, some other work um, by Wei and Chi in particular. They also use these outages and restore processes for the largest hurricanes. And um, that's, um, but they have a slightly different uh, take on this. They have an outage process and then they have a repair process. Um, and then they assume a certain order of repair and then that produces the restore process. On the other hand, I think it's more direct to, if you have lots of data, to, which we do, is to model the outage process and the restore process and not worry about which component was uh, repaired when. In any case, there's, there's, there's lots of other work, um, but I, I just wanted to highlight um, uh, Wei and Ji's work on this. And there's a queuing model also in, in, in Zapata's work as well. Um, so um, I, to conclude, um, uh, I'm advocating uh, for, if you've got real data um, for transmission system resilience, uh, it, the event algorithm is important. Um, that's a little bit tricky, but you can automatically extract the events. Um, once you've got the events, it's easy to get the performance curve. It's easy to get the outage process. It's easy to get the restore process. And all this works off very standard utility data. So that's good. And, um, and you get your resilience metrics from the shapes and dimensions of all these. I've been only talking about duration metrics. You can get all sorts of other metrics like the area from 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 these as well. But I'd like to also point out um, that this is only uh, describing one aspect of resilience and one aspect of the transmission system resilience. We're not really saying that the any of these metrics um, are absolute measures of resilience. And the reason is, um, for example, um, if you take the Eastern uh, interconnect, and, and look at the durations of the largest events, you're going to get many more long durations because the almost all the hurricanes happen in the eastern interconnect, and those are the ones that are um, with the long durations. So um, the fact that the western uh, area has um, shorter uh, doesn't really tell you much about the absolute resilience of either system, because it depends on the weather severity um, and the, um, you know, and uh, Anamika and I were just discussing that you, all the fires occur in the, in the, in the Western or not most of the fires occur in the, in the Western region. So, you, you know, again, it's all different. So you can't really take numbers for um, overall numbers for um, one interconnect and directly compare them with the other because we don't know how to coordinate it with the weather severity. That's something we got to think about and see what we can do in the future. And the other thing is we're not really looking at all. This is all very good if you're interested in the transmission system uh, in and out, uh, 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 components in and out. But we're not really looking at the impacts on the customers um, via the distribution system yet uh, because we're not coordinating it with the blackout size or anything like that. Um, and um, we don't even know um, uh, you know, how much power we lose at which substations in the data and those kinds of things uh, are not recorded yet. So um, we, this is all, again, future work, um, trying to uh, coordinate it with the, the impacts of these internal measures in the, in the transmission system. So I do think we're showing, we're, 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 we're um, doing something um, uh, that's valuable, uh, tracking what's going on in the transmission system, but um, there's some just very basic questions we're not we're only just starting to think about. When we think about all the duration metrics, the outage ones like duration of outages, time to first restore, the outage rate, these are pretty straightforward. But these restoration and event direction duration metrics suffer from statistical variability. Uh, the straightforward duration of 
the last restore minus the first restore is not recommended for mul multiple reasons. It's way too variable. Um, and if you want performance in terms of utility performance, I think you're best off with the geometric mean because it's least variable and also estimates the median. And for substantial restoration, if, if you want that, um, probably the quantile metrics do the best job, um, even though they're also highly variable. We've got to be aware of this variability when we start throwing around these metrics. Um, uh, if they're more more variable, we we got to be less um, fixated on its at its value according to how variable it is. Now, on the way to considering this question of of variability, we've devised new system level stochastic models um, of all these processes driven by data and validated to, to uh, the extent that they're true. So they're typical, but not doesn't don't cover all the cases. But I think it's very promising to get uh, new models for transmission systems resilience, um, uh, just generally. And I uh, raised the question, and I don't know whether it's controversial or not, um, but uh, the, the aspect of resilience analysis that we're doing, we engage with events, processes, transients, extremes, and heavy tails at a systems level, and it's highly complementary. It tells us something different and uses different methods than traditional reliability. And it's kind of exciting that all this stuff is happening in resilience. And um, I'll be very interested to see if you have any comments or questions. So thanks very much. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything, but. Yeah, uh, Ian, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, great. Uh, we were switching just the audio from one to other so that we don't get echo. So everything was muted for a while. Thank you so much for for wonderful presentation and for sharing the uh, recent work in this domain that you're doing. It was very interesting to hear you. We'll open up for Q&A. Um, let's start with if we have something online. So um, let's start with that question and then we'll switch back to student questions. So there is a question on chat uh, from Brent. Um, he's asking your work is primarily based on NERC TADS data. NERC also tracks uh, GADS, which is generation data. Does this data analysis and metrics also apply to uh, GADS or others working in, on that aspect? I am particularly interested in um, GADS within the uh, large scale renewable energy sector in the Midwest, wind and solar. <laughs> yes, that, that's a great question. Um, we we uh, we have the GADS data and we're considering how to do it. We're seeing if we can adapt some of these ideas to um, to the GADS data um, uh, because um, it, it, the availability of generation is is of course very important in, in resilience. And also we'd like to know whether the generation events uh, correspond with the, um, uh, um, the, the the transmission events and whether there's, there's some uh, linkage between them in, in the hurricanes. Um, so um, I, I, I love the question. Uh, we don't have an answer yet. Um, uh, the, um, the GADS data, has more um, background noise in 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 terms of generators going in and out. Um, what we what we can do is um, we can take a specific hurricane or something like that and look at that time period, maybe even um, uh, from 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 the TADS data, uh, the event uh, uh, duration, pull out that GADS data and track what's going on. With 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 that uh, generation um, uh, outages and D ratings and so on, so you you probably be interested in things like the um, the the generator availability relative to the the, the margin that's needed, um, and of course you need you need the margin especially when when there's a hurricane. So um, I love the question and and we're very interested, but I can't answer it beyond that um, very well. Thanks, Ian. OK, so Brent writes, thanks. Thank you. Totally agree with GATS data is noisy compared to TAT certainly presents unique challenges. All right, so we'll open up for students. Questions? So is the data used in this analysis available? 
So the question, Ian, is that is the data available? Uh, is it open source data that you're using in this analysis? Um, uh, no, um, this is anonymized data from NERC. So I I have the exact uh, outage times and I have codes for which element, um, but um, I don't have the uh, locations um, because they're they're masked. Um, so, um, but NERC has this anonymized data available. Um, uh, you could certainly contact them and ask if they'll be where, willing to share it. Um, and um, so that's the status. It, the, the data belongs to NERC, and they have an anonymized form of it that they share to some researchers. Now, if you want open source data, um, in your area of the world, BPA publishes um, this data on their website. In the in their transmission system um, uh, operations, so you can get uh, 15, 20 years of this data from BPA just by going to their website and downloading it. So that's available. And the other open source state way is for New York ISO. They publish uh, outage data in a rather convoluted form, but you can um, uh, you can process it to get. Uh, most of the data this way, so that, those are the only open source ones I'm avail. Uh, I know that are available. I, I think the I think the data is a gold mine for yeah. <laughs> actually for <laughs> a number Eastern. of different purposes. So uh, yes, uh, so I I, um, I appreciate the question. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, all right. Um, I see Anjan unmuted. Um, have a comment or question? Uh, uh, yes, can I ask a question? Yep, please go ahead. Uh, so let me turn, uh, uh, since you are going into the general um, area of re uh, comparing reliability with resiliency, uh, the question of course comes out uh, uh, this way from, from the utilities. Uh, the reliability criteria uh, or standards that NERC has leads to ways you can plan your transmission and your generation in such a way that it meets those criteria. The question is, on the resiliency side, we don't have any design criteria or planning or design criteria that I can use as a utility to uh, get to a level of resiliency that might meet one of the uh, statistical measures that you were suggesting. So any Comments on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, exactly to the point. Um, that um, uh, you know, for for example, um, on uh, we NERC has 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 criteria for um, certain c compound events, um, and um, you know, on the distribution level is SADI and SAFI and so on, and these guide um, the kinds of tests people do. Um, and um, I think the challenge for us as a field is to come up with ways of quantifying resilience that um, so that resilience considerations could also be thrown in the mix. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. I, um, I, I, I think this is, I think part of it has to be, I think part of it has to be metrics that we can compute from data. And so that's why my, I want to start from the data and then see what I can do with that data um, that they already have. Because so I don't want to go to the utilities and say, um, you know, uh, measure something new or something. That's a lot of work. Um, so starting from what what they already have, can we get get the metrics out? So that's that's the first thing. Um, but I don't think we're there yet because I don't think. It's coordinated with the weather severity or the impacts at the transmission level. At the distribution level, I think um, we're doing a little better with the data. We don't have uh, because you have customers out and customer hours out um, uh, in 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 the typical uh, distribution system data that corresponds to this. Um, and um, so we, we we're doing a little better on the impact, um, uh, but. Uh, you know, reliability. One one version of reliability is 
just satisfy the NERC criteria, but they're done on a certain assumptions about what sort of thing you're trying to do. And when we're trying to do something new, like make the system resilient and get that included in some sort of qualitative or quantitative way in decisions, um, I think we have a ways to go. But I do think that um, uh, being able to, there's no point in having metrics we can't calculate from data or, um, and we need simulations that are calibrated with real data. So I think um, there's been more work on the simulations than the data. And I'm, uh, but I think they're both important. I mean, I, that's an attempt to answer your, 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 your very good question. Um, what do you think? Well, it, 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 yes, I, I think you're right. We don't know the answer to the question. But since you are working, you are working with NERC. I thought that that is, is a subject you might have discussed with them and have some opinions. Well, they are using um, the data processing um, and the metrics in their state of reliability reports. Yeah. So, um, uh, in a, in a descriptive way. That, if, that you can look at all the events and you look at look, look at the big ones and you can extract all these metrics with these with these and and um, they think it's significant in um, quantifying what in a descriptive way what happened in the transmission system. I don't think that's exactly the so it's useful, but um, I don't think that's. Ex I was trying to indicate that if 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 you if you asked me. How resilient is this transmits to transmission system? I don't think I can answer that yet. <laughs> so that I think both could be true. <laughs> uh, All right. Um, any final questions from students? I'm not a student. <laughs> I, I am Carl Hauser. Uh, so hi, Carl. I'll follow up on on John's question. Uh, the other. The other thing about metrics is you'd like to have some engineering principles or engineering processes that would point you in the direction of of improving your metrics. And yes, uh, any thoughts about where we stand on that side? Of it? Okay, so you 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 take you take your favorite you take your favorite metric. Um, uh, you know whether it's customers as hours out on a on a distribution system or uh, number of outages or area under the um, uh, under the performance curve. You know elements hours out in in, in a, or megawatt uh, equivalent megawatt rating out or whatever you like. Um, and um, I think I think you can do. Um, uh, some 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 analysis from the historical data, which which is which is what this is, um, by um, by sampling from it um, to see what the effect would have been if you had made certain resilience investments. So I I believe that's a viable way to proceed, and I'm working with my student Arslan Ahmad on this on this topic. Um, uh, so I I think. There's versions of quantifying resilience that can be done from the historical data, but some of these are fairly overall types of things. Um, like, um, uh, for 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 example, if 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 you got more arrangements with uh, sister utilities to to import more people when there's a disaster to fix it faster, and you could fix things 10% faster, clearly your duration metrics would go down 10%, right? And and that will be helpful, but how? I mean, but exactly how you would achieve that ten percent? That's a matter of en detailed engineering, and that's where some of the simulation models will be very useful. In 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 if 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 you can overall look at the data and say, okay, ten percent um, uh, faster restoration would have this impact uh, on the metrics, um, and then the question is, how do we achieve that ten percent? Um, uh, uh, advantage that is a matter of detailed engineering because there's lots of things you could do other than um, bring in uh, more crews. Uh, you could, um, uh, you know, distribute supplies around in 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 
uh, backup supplies in more places. You could optimize the, the way you rolled the trucks. There's all sorts of things that utilities already do that they might want to do better. And this is a perfect opportunity for some of the detailed simulations to come and say, how do you do the detailed engineering to get an overall 10% in, uh, uh, increase? So I, I see the answer being something coordinated between historical data playing some role and the simulations playing some role and just some of the basic engineering uh, being essential to the detailed engineering being essential to actually achieve any of this. I, hope, I does that really does that answer the question, uh, Carl? Or yes, I, I think so. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> So we, we are running out of time, but just to add on to that, Ian, just a quick question. How do you think that how how based on your experience with the real data, how much uh, these uh, metrics that you're quantifying or the improvements that might happen with, let's say, some more investment vary from region to region or, or system to system? Is there how, how big of a role does a exact simulation model for the networks play in all these planning and analysis process? Well, um, there's a. I did, a, you know, very briefly allude to the fact that different systems have different threats, and we discussed that just before the seminar. Um, that and any specific transmission system has its priority threats that are the most important, um, and um, so. The systems are designed a bit different also, and they have different ages and different policies and all sorts of things. So um, I, I generally see a lot of, um, I see more opportunity for the, the data-driven analysis to do overall things. Like just a very basic question. If you've got, um, you know, um, $20 million to invest, do, do or, or, or whatever the number is, do you invest it in faster restoration or do you, you spend it on hardening um, poles or, um, uh, or things like that? I mean, that's a very basic question, right? A resilience investment question. And we, that's kind of reason we want to quantify resilience. So we'd like to try and answer those kinds of questions. I'm not answering it today, clearly. I'm just... Uh, talking about metrics, but um, I, I think that's a good question. Six. And then, then once you have that, um, uh, and you know how a ten percent imp improvement of one of those um, affects the um, the metrics, and you know what change in metrics you want, then then you then there's a big role for the simulations because um, the good thing about the data processing is you don't you, you can you only roughly know the causes. I mean, you know when it's a hurricane, you know when it's an earthquake, you know when it's a fire and those kinds of things. Um, so you can classify them and do analysis on each. But you don't, that doesn't tell you how a specific mit engineering mitigation will affect um, the, um, the, 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 the outages or the restores. And I, I, I'm not sure if I'm, a, yep. I'm just trying to, it's a good perspective. I, I I get a point. I mean, it's still a question. How do we merge the data and models together to answer these questions? Yes, and it and it goes beyond just um, using the data to to validate and calibrate the models, which is of course very important. I don't see it. I don't see the models being able to capture everything about the gross effects because, um, for example, when you think about wind um, hitting a um, a power system, the wind's highly variable, you know, both in time and space, and the poles uh, and the structures are highly variable. And um, I don't think you can capture that easily in 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 a in a simulation to predict the number of outages given a certain wind speed or something like that. So um, I think um, that maybe is a role for data. And uh, but but to do the engineering to solve the whole problem, I think that the um, civil engineering models and the general resilience models will 
play a very significant role in figuring out where, what type of hardening to use and that kind of thing. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, all, I'm sort of saying both and all the time, I think. No, no, it, it, it makes sense for sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so thank you so much, Ian, for spending time with us today and for the talk. Uh, it was um, very uh, useful to learn about your work. Um, we'll post this uh, slides and your presentation online, and if students have any questions, they can uh, reach out to you. You have shared your email address. And with that, we'll um, uh, end today's session. Thank you so much, Ian. Well, thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to present to such a distinguished power group. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye. Yeah, take care, everyone.